So Dr. Brianne Tideman is a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Lacombe. She completed all of her degrees at the University of Alberta and holds a BSc in Biological Sciences and an MSc and a PhD in Plant Sciences with projects focused on weed science and weed management. Brianne started with AAFC in 2016 as a weed scientist slash field agronomist. Her research program in Lacombe focuses on management of herbicide resistant weeds, integrated weed management strategies, weed biology, and alternative methods of weed control. She lives in Blackfelds, Alberta with her husband and her two sons, and today she's going to talk about outside-the-box weed control. All right, thank you, Kim. Uh, and thank you for having me here today. I'm excited to be back. It's been th since, I think, about 2018 since I was here last, so it's nice to be back with you guys to talk about outside-the-box weed control. Uh, before I get into it, I just want to thank all the funders of my research program with Ag Canada, as well as the technical staff. Uh, Larry, Liz, Patty, and Jen put up with a lot when it comes to doing weed science projects sometimes. Some of the data they have to take is not that fun, and I appreciate all their efforts. Um, moving into weed control, though, and I'm starting really basic, and I know that. Just bear with me for a minute. Weeds are crop pests. We don't like them. We want to deal with them. The dominant global weed management tactic really is herbicide application. Um, and I just wanna sort of set the stage here for some of what we're gonna talk about a little bit later, but our herbicide applications are really targeting weeds either at the seedling stage or at emergence. Those are really our two time points that we're trying to kill those weeds. And I'm bringing this up now because I'm gonna talk about a shift to that in some of these later tactics. Now there is a need for non-herbicide management. Herbicide resistance is continuing to increase. So this is the increase in the number of unique herbicide resistance cases. So this is a species to a mode of action. But in addition to all of these new cases that we're seeing, the ones that we already had are becoming more common. They're taking up more area. They're becoming more frequent. So it's, it's sort of a two-pronged thing. Yeah, we're having new ones, but the ones we already had are also spreading. So we really need to be looking at non-herbicide management tactics. What herbicide alternatives are there? There are lots. Some of them are field ready and ready to use tomorrow. Okay, not tomorrow, there's a lot of snow. This field season, some of them are ready to use this field season. Some of them are very futuristic and we are talking you know, five, 10, 15 years down the road potentially. Some of them are crop specific, very specific right now to horticulture crops, vegetable crops, those types of things. Um, but that technology that's being developed, there is potential for it to move into our broad acre crops in the future. So the goal for today is to start with some of the field ready, small tweak type stuff, move into the real sort of out there, out of the box, Futurama type stuff. So that's sort of where we're going today. So starting really back to basics, we're gonna start with cultural controls. These are your basics that you can put into the field in the next field season that can have significant impacts on your weeds. So I'm going back to those of you, there's some of you here that would know my predecessor, Dr. Neil Harker, who worked at A Canada in Lacombe. This is his research. Uh, so he was looking at cultural strategies to manage wild oats. And so he looked at three different cultural strategies, increasing a seeding rate of barley from a 1x to a 2x seeding rate, going from a short to a tall variety with the theory that the tall variety would be more competitive. So increasing the competitiveness of the chosen variety. And then growing barley in a continuous barley, 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 barley versus a barley, canola, barley, pea rotation. So if you did one of those things, those top three in the table there, you reduced wild oat biomass by two to three fold by one single change. If you did two out of those three changes, you reduce the wild oat biomass by six to eight fold. If you did all three, it reduced the wild oat biomass by 19 fold by changing just the cropping system, the variety, the seeding rate, the rotation, had that big of an impact on wild oat. Now, visually, let's take a look at that. This is the short barley variety, the low seeding rate, the continuous barley. Now you'll notice at the bottom it says a quarter rate of herbicide. This was in the time frame where cut rate herbicides were really of interest. So they put a low quarter rate of herbicide on this one. Please do not say I advocated for that. I did not advocate for that. I did not say that. This is just what happened here. Okay. Here is the tall barley variety at the 2x seeding rate in rotation. Pictures taken on the same day in the same rep. There's a lot fewer wild oats in that second picture. No change to the herbicide management. <clears throat> Neil continued some of this work uh, and wanted to look at even more diverse rotations. So this is a 2x seeding rate spring wheat plot with zero herbicide applied to it. 
This was in 2013. The two years preceding it were early cut barley silage, again with no wild oat herbicide. So this is three years without wild oat herbicide. There are some wild oats in there, but it's really not that horrible, as you might expect, for no herbicide for wild oats for three years. This is a 2x winter triticale plot. No wild oat herbicide. Two years preceding, no wild oat herbicide. One in early cut barley silage, one in a 2x winter wheat. So incorporating winter cereals added that much more diversity to the rotation, that much more competition against the wild oats, reduced the wild oats that much more. So again, simple things, not necessarily simple when it comes to winter cereals, but increasing a seeding rate is a fairly simple tactic that can have big uh, impacts on those weed densities. I want to move into a little bit of precision herbicide use. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Tom just did a great overview of a lot of these things. Um, but I want to start with inter-row spraying. So aside from specific spot spraying, without having to go to quite that high of a technology, you can just go inter-row. You can use non-select herbicides. You can use different modes of action that maybe the crop is not normally tolerant to, but you're not spraying it on the crop. You're spraying it between the crop. Issues with this is that you're only managing those weeds that are in between the rows, not in the rows with the crop, right? But it is an alternative management tactic. Brown on green, I'm gonna go through this one real fast. Tom just talked a whole lot about it, right? Green on green weed detection, being able to tank mix different herbicides, being able to spot spray a non-selective herbicide on just the weed. A lot, it really expands your ability to use different types of herbicides and in different strategies uh, than what you did before. Now the next one I'm gonna show might get a couple laughs when I'm calling this a precision uh, herbicide application, but it is wick wiping. Wick wiping really is a precision herbicide application. It's an older technology, but you are only targeting the weeds that are present above the crop canopy. It is a precision application of that herbicide. Now, again, those of you who know Neil may have seen some of his presentations and would know that he was a far side comic fan. And we found one that was very appropriate to this type of application. It's the long-headed chicken that you're going to get out of these crops. The ones that are sticking its head out are the ones that are going to get caught. But it is very much a precision where, in terms of where that herbicide is being applied. But, Tom alluded to this, these are all still herbicides. You are still putting a selection pressure on for herbicide resistance. You might be able to use different herbicide groups, non-selectives, different modes of action, but it doesn't eliminate herbicide resistance as an issue. It prolongs the longevity of those herbicides, and that was great terminology on that, Tom. We are going to come back to some of these same concepts in a little bit in terms of recognition, in terms of height differentials, um, but with non-herbicide tools attached, similar to like the weed chipper that Tom showed. But I want to move into something that is sort of one of my soapboxes or passions to talk about, which is harvest weed seed control. Now, this is changing the when of weed control. So instead of changing the where, now we're changing the when. So what is harvest weed seed control? It's a new paradigm of weed control that's really been de developed and refined in Australia. You might notice a little bit of a pattern here with some of these technologies coming out of Australia because of the ryegrass issues they were dealing with. Really, the goal with harvest weed seed control is to manage the weed seeds that are still in the field at harvest and prevent their dispersal. So right now, when we take our combines through at the end of a field season, the weed seeds that are in there, most of them are coming out right over here in the chaff at the back of the combine. What are we doing with those weed seeds? We are broadcast seeding them. We're broadcasting them to be next year's problem. That's exactly what we are doing with them. And so the goal of harvest weed seed control is to stop doing that. Stop giving those weeds that benefit and advantage of what we're doing with them. So this is where I wanted to talk about sort of that, that life cycle stage. So I said herbicides are mostly targeting the seedling stage and when they're emerging from the seed bank. What we're doing with harvest weed seed control is targeting that big arrow on top, trying to stop the seeds that the adult produce from going back into the seed bank. Let's stop them there so that we don't have to deal with them next year. Now, in order for harvest weed seed control to be effective, weed seeds have to be retained at the time of crop harvest. So if they've already dropped to the ground, they're gone, we're not getting them back. You can't do anything with those ones. They need to be produced at a height where they'll be collected by the combine. So if they're too low to the ground, producers are not cutting that low because they're going to damage their equipment. Again, you're not going to get them through the combine to then target them. And you have to be able to collect the weed with the combine. Now, that one sounds sort of like, well, duh, Brianne, you think? Um, but I add it for a reason. So on this picture on the right-hand side of your screen, there are two turnip weed plants in there. So this was a picture I took when I was in Australia. Seed retention was fantastic. There was no shattering of this weed at all. They're about my height. 
getting them into the common because height, not an issue. But they were really round and really bushy. And when we would take the combine through, they would roll up and over top of the reel and then off the side of the header. We couldn't actually get them to feed into the damn combine. So if you can't get them into the combine, you can't control them. So another sort of twist to that one. There are multiple methods of harvest weeds to control. I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly. Uh, top left is narrow windrow burning. So that line behind the combine, that's all the straw and all the chaff dropped together in a line. They would do this on every pass and then go out and burn each of these. Now, I am not saying that every one of these is going to be a good fit in Canada. I am just telling you what methods there are. Uh, and this is one that worked really well. Not ideal, but the, that burning actually was killing, you know, 95% of those weed seeds in the, in the chaff line. Uh, the middle top is the bale direct system. So instead of spreading the chaff and the straw, put it into a bale. You take the bale off the field and there go your weed seeds too. Great. They're gone. You lose some nutrients, but the weed seeds are gone, and that was the number one goal. Top right picture is chaff lining. So you're dropping just the chaff into a line behind the combine. Uh, and the idea is that there's a composting or rotting effect that happens in that chaff line that reduces their emergence. And even if you don't get a great composting effect, at least you're not spreading them over the entire field. Now they're just in this small of an area instead. Bottom left, that's a chaff cart. Those were actually originally developed in Western Canada. Uh, didn't catch on huge across a ton of acres. There are certain farmers that use them a lot. Um, but Australia sort of took them, modified them, made them better, and used them quite widely in some areas of Western Australia. The chaff is collected, they dump the chaff, and that is either then burned or grazed, particularly by sheep. Middle picture is chaff tram lining. It's essentially chaff lining, but in a controlled traffic farming system. So put that chaff down onto your tram lines, your wheel tracks. You drive over it multiple times, so you get a physical weed control aspect there. You could spot spray it if you wanted. Uh, again, you're hoping for that composting effect, and it's your least productive part of your field. So multiple reasons that they like that. Bottom right is um, the original version of physical impact mills where the chaff gets put into a mill system that then grinds or breaks down those seeds and breaks them into small enough pieces that they aren't going to germinate. Um, that is the original version. That is the toe behind Harrington Seed Destructor. That is actually what I work with at Ag Canada and Lacombe. Uh, but there's been a little bit of advancement on those as well. So this is the new physical impact mills. As you can see, there's no mammoth machine being pulled behind the combine anymore. These are built directly into the combine. So there are four brands on the market. There's the IHSD or the Integrated Harrington Seed Destructor, the Redicop Seed Control Unit. Now you may recognize the name Redicop. They're based in Saskatchewan. So we have a Canadian made version of one of these mills. Uh, seed Terminator, and then the bottom right is the Tech Farm Weed Hog. They have great names for these mills. I love all their names. Um, anyways, three of those, the IHSD, the Seed Terminator, and the Weed Hog, those are all Australian. As I mentioned, Redicop is in Saskatchewan. Now, why don't we see these everywhere? Why is everyone not adapting them? Um, this, the price tag. The price tag comes into play. Now, this slide is a couple years old. Uh, this is from about 2020, so those prices have, I believe, come down a little bit. Um, you'll see the Tech Farm Weed Hog at 50 to 60K, and you're like, great, let's all use that one. Uh, it's a slightly different type of mill than the other ones, and it's a little bit less uh, efficacious on the weed seed. So you're talking 75 to 80% control is what I've seen versus 95 plus percent control of what's going into them. Um, the 90, 110, and 120, those are sort of your main three right around that 100 grand mark. The bottom right, the 50 to 60K, that's a single mill unit of the integrated seed destructor. All of the other ones are running two mills. Um, and that single one really probably wouldn't be an option in Canada just because of the sheer volume of crops that we, we grow here. So yeah, price. Price is the big barrier to adoption, I would say, right now. Um, lack, of, lack of efficacy data on Western Canadian weeds. I promise I'm working on it. I have a lot of data that I'm trying to get through right now on it. Uh, but I still hear this. It's not needed because my herbicides still work. And then there's the little caveat of, well, most of the time they still work. And I say, okay, I'll come talk to you again in five years. And, and we'll see where we're at then. <clears throat> I get a lot of questions about what, what do these mills really do? What does it look like? It looks like this. So these are three different types of chaff, barley, pea, and canola. The left-hand pail is what I put into the Harrington Seed Destructor. It's a five-gallon pail worth full of chaff of that crop. And what, on the right is what came out of it. So a very fine, very itchy dust is essentially what comes out of there. 
there's possibly some signs of it catching on. Uh, when I started this work in 2014, there was absolutely no mills in Canada at all. Uh, by 2018-19, there was about two seed terminators running in Saskatchewan. 2020, there was four seed terminators and about five Redicop seed control units. Uh, and at this point, there's between 20 and 30 units running across the prairies, is the last update that I was given. Um, other forms of harvest weed seed control, I have a few guys that hear me talk about the mills and they're like, you know, that's really interesting, but I don't, I don't spread my weeds. I leave that area and I come back and I bale them. I go, well, you're essentially doing harvest weed seed control. You're just doing it in two steps instead of one. But you're doing the same concept. That's great. Keep doing that. But it's the same idea. So that's the harvest weed seed control spiel. Uh, moving into more site-specific but the non-herbicide version, uh, into row tillage. So this is a picture actually from Catherine Stanley. This is work that was done here at the University of Manitoba in Dr. Martin Nance's group, uh, working on inter row tillage with the Garford Robo crop in this case, uh, where it was vision guided. So there was a camera on there that would identify the crop rows and the tillage would go inter row in between and take out the weeds that were inter row. Again, focusing on inter row, not getting any of the ones that are in the row with the crop. Uh, weed clipping. Again, I've got a Catherine picture because the comb cut is here at the University of Manitoba as well. Um, the comb cut is an interesting one. This is a unit from Sweden that is set up that you could selectively remove broadleafs in cereal crops when the cereal crop was young enough, so before the cereals were jointed. Um, there are issues with it if your weed and your crop stages are not quite synchronous. So if your weed only gets big enough at the time that your cereal crop is jointed, then you end up damaging your cereal crop quite a bit and things like that. So there's some synchrony issues there. But you can also use that sort of chicken with the long neck idea again, raise this above the crop and clip off weed seed heads as well. Now, I've talked about this unit before and I've gotten, how big is that thing? Well, it's 12 feet. That's not nearly big enough for the acres I'm running. Okay, how about the Borgo 50 foot weed clipper? Same idea, you can clip weed seeds or weed seed heads above the crop, but on a 50 foot width instead. And that one, as you can see, is actual spinning mower blades. It's essentially a, a, a mower that they've just set up so that you can raise it above your crop height. Um, but again, that allows you to do that same idea, prevent those weed seeds from being produced, get them out of the field before they're going into the seed bank, before they're mature, um, on a fairly large scale. That would be more compatible with sort of our large acre crops. Now, obviously, if you have a very uneven field, there might be some concern about 50 feet doing this and then taking off your crop heads. Um, obviously, things that need to be worked out as well. The weed puller, this is another interesting one for me. Uh, it's essentially tires that spin in opposite directions, goes over top of the crop, and it pulls out weeds by that sort of spinning opposite directions motion. Um, you can see the lamb's quarters or the pigweed, I can't remember which one it is in there, that it effectively pulled out. Impact of soil moisture here. In really, really dry soil, the weeds tend to just break off because it's too hard to get them out of the soil. So if there's a little bit of moisture in the soil, then it'll actually pull it out by the roots kind of thing. Uh, doesn't work as well for grasses. I got her to try this for me on wild oats. Again, the grasses had a tendency to break off and then re-tiller, and the tillers would stay then in the crop canopy where she couldn't get to them a second time. But again, same idea, chicken with the long neck, let's take you out because we can get to you. There's a differential, a way to differ you from the crop. Site or weed specific, but going high tech now. Um, let's electrocute the weeds. Let's just kill them that way. Sounds like a lot of fun. I would really love to test one of these. So far, I haven't talked to anyone into giving me one. Um, there's a few different versions of these, a few different brands of these. I've got the weed zapper shown up here. Uh, you can find ones that are non-selective, so you could use it for like a pre-seed burn-off. Um, the Zazo version of this is, a, is more of a non-selective one, um, whereas the Weeded is more of, again, the chicken with the long neck, let's take out what's, what's showing over top of the crop canopy. So if you have a shorter crop like soybeans when they're smaller, then you might have access to a lot of those weeds uh, early on. It would also work great in a crop like lentils um, that stays nice and short. Electrical weeding seems to be really good on tall broadleaves. There is some moisture dependent efficacy and I have heard um, some discussion about um, ion solutions that you can spray in front of the electrical weeder to increase efficacy and things like that. I haven't seen a lot of testing on that. I don't know a whole lot about it, but there is some, some discussion about that. Uh, it does seem to be less effective on grasses, with the issue being that you can hit that main stem, but you're not getting the tillers of the grasses or the branches of the grasses. Um, however, 
that's been more so discussed in terms of the actual plant death, but whether or not that electrical current is affecting weed seed viability, that hasn't been studied as much. Um, they are available, commercially available. They've been researched a fair bit actually in Eastern Canada in soybean and um, vegetable crops in Ontario, as well as wild blueberries in Nova Scotia. Um, there are two that I know of running in Alberta. I have not managed to track down the producers to let me uh, collect data on their farms yet. I'm still trying. Um, and I've heard of a couple others in the prairies as well. So they are actually commercially available and being used particularly in organic production at this point. Yep. Uh, laser weeding. Uh, some of you probably saw this on Twitter over the, the summer and the fall. This seemed to be a big thing. Uh, again, it's right now being developed for high value horticulture crops using artificial intelligence weed recognition. So some of those same types of algorithms that Tom is talking about. This one is really interesting because it lasers the weed meristem, so it's got a fairly high rate of not having those weeds grow back after it's been lasered. Um, I do have significant concerns about using this in no-till conditions when you're hiring, firing a high-powered laser when there is really dry crop residue around. I have fears of it going zap, kapoof into a big fire. Um, it's possible that there's ways to mitigate that by you know, going after a rain or something like that. Um, but really interesting to see where this technology goes to and how it develops and how it might be applied to uh, broad acre crops in the future. And then the robots are coming. We can't talk about outside the box weed control without talking about robots. Uh, so there's sort of two different categories of robot weeders that I've seen right now. There is the passive weeders, which are really inter-row only. They're tillage. Um, it tends to be sort of GPS or row vision guidance where it just recognizes the crop rows and guides it in between, uh, and not so much the actual artificial intelligence or recognition. Most of these that I have seen are tillage based. It's just a, a cultivator of some kind going down in between the rows. Then there is the active weeding, which are again actively using artificial intelligence, um, weed versus crop recognition. You do need a different algorithm for every crop. And this is again being more developed for specialty or horticulture crops. I've heard price tags on some of these robots in that quarter of a million dollars range, so they are not cheap and not necessarily going to go in the field in the next uh, field season. These ones tend to be lower disturbance because it is just going specifically for that weed. Uh, this, in this case, this is the la chèvre, the goat, for those of us that don't speak French. Um, and it is sort of pulling. I've got a video on the next slide, but you could use other implements like lasers using this same type of technology. So this one is fully autonomous. Um, I do have questions about regulations around these types of robots, if we're just allowed to release them and let them do their thing and not have to supervise them. Um, but I do want to say thank you to the Egg Robotics Working Group uh, for this video. This is actually testing the GOAT in Ontario this past summer, um, and they are continuing to do field testing primarily in horticulture crops in Ontario in the next couple of years. I love how its little fingers go out and pull the weed. Uh, so outside the box weed control, just in summary, it doesn't have to be fancy or difficult to implement. You can just look at tweaks to the cropping system. I didn't talk about it today, but you can look at tweaks to the fertilizer placement, and that can impact your weeds. It doesn't have to be fancy and high tech. There is a lot of new technology out there to help our weed control be more effective and efficient, and really this is limited by your imagination. The harvest weed seed control tactics that I talked about, five out of the six of those were developed by farmers who were in a corner trying to manage annual ryegrass and looking for a new way to do things. It was their imagination and their creativity that came up with those methodologies. I would say though that it is necessary in the face of resistance to continue to successfully manage our weeds long term. This is what I hear a lot when I talk about this kind of thing, you want me to quit spraying? No, I'm not saying you have to stop spraying. These are not, many of them, not standalone tactics. And really, when you talk about weeds, redundancy is the key for long-term success. And really not letting the most problematic ones be the ones that produce seed. So what I'm saying is let's not focus on the chemical bubble of the IWM diagram and forget about everything else. Let's actually use all those other bubbles together to actually manage our weeds. So thank you again for having me here today, and if I have time, I'll take a couple questions. Have we got any questions here? Oh, hang on. Yes, I guess I don't need those. <laughs> Hi, great presentation. Oops. With regards to the seed destructor yep. uh, technology, um, I recall reading about even resistance issues evolving from that. And I appreciate 
your last slide emphasizing all methods, all tools to be combined, but can you elaborate a little bit on why there are some resistance issues from what you would think of physical destruction? Yep. Um, so I guess my, I'll, I'll start by telling you my pet peeve is hearing of any weed seed management tactic that there's no resistance issues, I call bull. Um, the weeds will always shift. So in terms of seed destruction, what we were seeing is weed seeds dropping sooner. So you're selecting for those earlier maturing weeds that will drop their seeds earlier, or you're selecting for weeds that become more prostrate. So suddenly a weed that was an upright weed now is growing down here so that you can't get it into the combine. So you will see weed species shifts. When we're using lasers, you'll see a shift either in times of emergence. You'll see a, a waxier cuticle so that you need to use a longer exposure to a laser for resistance. There will be development of resistance to any strategy that you put out because it is a selection pressure and weeds are fickle and they like to spite us. <laughs> and it keeps me in a job. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Okay, well with that, I'd really like to thank you, Brianne. We have something here for you and it was a great presentation as always. Thank you. Thank you.